Okay. Uh, we'll continue our discussions on mechanism design, and today's class is about auctions. It's a fairly large field of uh, study, and recently auctions have become quite commonplace because of Google and uh, Facebook ads, as well as Amazon Cloud. Uh, it's uh, auctions have been around for a long time. Uh, the first mention of auction was 500 BCE. Okay, so uh, people were using auctions even in old age, uh, even in uh, pre-0 AD age as well. Okay, and uh, what all things can you auction? Well, you can auction mining rights, fine arts, real estate, uh, wine. So I don't know if many of you know, but you can buy wine, make it old, and then sell it at a higher price. Okay, that's a good way, good income stream if you don't want to do any work. Uh, but you need to know how, how to make, what kind of wines can you make old to make it better and things like that. Okay, I, I don't know any of that, so. But I know that people do it, and you can find good wines on Craigslist for 200 $300. Uh, you can uh, auction radio spectrum, so let's say you have 100 megahertz to, not 100, whatever, 500 megahertz to some 2 gigahertz spectrum. You want to auction, let's say in a band of 20, 20 uh, megahertz. Uh, you can do that auction, I mean government runs that auction and gets a lot of money. Um, some of you who are from India would have heard about 2G scam and 3G scam and so on. It was all about auction of uh, radio spectrum. Uh, vintage cars, they are also auctioned, okay? So I'm expecting that my 2011 Toyota Corolla, at one point of time, it will become a multi-million dollar car, okay? Uh, 200 years later, so my, uh, my next generation will have a lot of money because I bought a car in 2011, uh, okay? Uh, so let me cover Google and Facebook ads, of course. Uh, they are auctioned in real time. Uh, you have Amazon Cloud which does auctioning of uh, cloud resources. And then Uber search can also be considered as an auction, uh, uh, wherein uh, you're trying to auction a service to people who are willing to use that service in real time. Uh, there are multiple types of auction. So let's see what the types are. Uh, you could have open bid or sealed bid auction. Okay, sealed bid means nobody else can see your bid. Open bid means everybody else can see your bid. Okay, so open bid and sealed bid auctions. So this is different information structure. So if you are the auction designer, you would want to understand how giving different information to people in the auction is going to change the equilibrium behavior of the game, of the underlying game. Uh, second one is, so what is an example of open bid auction? So eBay auction is an example of open bid auction. Uh, if, you, if you own a company and you want to uh, uh, put in your request for, uh, so you want, to, you want to bid for your company name to appear first in the Google search, that's a sealed bid auction. Uh, if you want to buy houses uh, in the US, that's also a sealed bid auction. You don't know what other people are bidding for, for that particular house. Then you have private value and common value auction. So private value auction means uh, uh, something that you value privately, but others may not value it as much. Something like art, wine, those are private value auctions if you auction that kind of object. Common value action is more like uh, auctioning of a land for commercial activity or auctioning of a piece of land for oil drilling and so on. So no, no matter who gets that, that particular mine, uh, he's going to make the same amount of profit because there's some, uh, some, uh, some stuff like oil or minerals that are there in that particular uh, mine and it can be extracted and sold in the open market for profit. Right? So that's common value auction. Then the third is single object 
or multi object auction so of course we so we will concentrate on single object auction uh, in this particular class because multi object auctions are fairly complicated set of auctions uh, if the object is divisible for instance uh, water is kind of divisible it's a divisible good you can divide it in any proportion so that could also be a multi object auction but the most important is combinatorial auction okay where you bid on bundles of good okay you've heard of bundled plan right you, you might be getting bundled plan from AT&T and stuff okay so that can be thought of as a combinatorial auction even though the number of combinations is very small okay you buy internet you buy internet plus tv you buy internet plus tv plus home phone i mean there are only three bundles available uh, in that in those sort of uh, situations okay but you can but combinatorial auctions are important because if you think about uh, spectrum auctions if there are two cities nearby you would want to buy uh, the frequency range let's say you want to buy frequency range you can buy two different frequency ranges in two different adjacent cities or you can buy the same frequency range or you can have multiple you can have uh, one frequency range for radio communication one frequency range for television communication or whatever some other form of communication right so you can have multiple you can build a bundle and then you can uh, put in a request for that kind of auction but you know it's not although it is it is it has been studied a lot in the literature it's fairly difficult problem to solve okay so uh, those of you who want to uh, uh, who want to solve hard problems should probably concentrate on combinatorial auctions okay and i i can be in your thesis committee i'll be very happy to be in your thesis committee okay so these are the three different types of auction um, this pertains to information structure in auction this pertains to what the value of the object is that is being auctioned this pertains to the number of objects that are being auctioned at the same time so we will in this particular lecture we will talk about single object private value auctions okay so there is only one object that is being auctioned it has a private value to the individual and it's an auction uh, we'll talk both about open bid as well as sealed bid auctions so what are the different auction formats for this class of auctions so most common formats so the first one is english auction and as the name suggests this kind of auction was practiced in england it's an open bid ascending auction okay open bid means everyone is sitting in a room and then you say you know how many who wants to buy i don't know this watch uh, and then i'll start with 0 dollars and many people will raise their hand and then i'll say 1 dollar then some hand will go down 2 dollars 3 dollars and so on and at at the end there is only one hand going to be up and the object will be sold to that person for that price okay so that's the english auction then there is dutch auction which is open bid descending auction okay so this is the same as ascending i mean this is the same as uh, english auction but now you are descending so i'll start with 1 million dollars for this watch nobody is going to put their hands up then i'll reduce it to 900000 uh, nobody is interested okay and then i'll come down to 10 dollars and at least one of you will be interested <laughs> in this 
in buying this object at ten dollar price. Okay, so that's a descending auction. That's called Dutch auction. And then uh, sealed bid first price auction. Okay, so sealed bid. Whoever is the highest bidder is going to pay the price that the person bid. Okay, so. This is usually very common in U.S. housing market. So if you want to buy a house in U.S., uh, it's the, the a house is auctioned through sealed bid first price auction. Then you have sealed bid second price auction. And as we studied in the previous class, this is known as Vickery auction. And in this case, you have sealed bid, but the price of the object that the highest bidder pays is the second highest price, second highest bid uh, for that particular auction. Okay, so that's known as Vickery auction, and it has uh, being truthful is a weakly dominant strategy in this case, in the sealed bid case. So this is something we have already studied in the previous class. This was an application of VCG mechanism. Then you have sealed bid auction. With reserve price. Okay, so reserve price is something that the auctioneer, the person who's selling the good, uh, that person has some reserve price. So he's not going to sell the item at a price lower than the reserve price. So this is uh, common, uh, fairly common in uh, eBay. So this is something that I have done, but never won it. So if you go to eBay and you, let's say you want to look for a round trip coupon from, let's say some airline, okay? So you can go to eBay and you can write that thing that I, so, so you can say that I want to buy this particular item, you search for it. Some people will have a reserve price and they won't tell you what the reserve price is, okay? Uh, in some cases, they will start that the bid has to start with $60, okay? So $60 becomes a reserve price. So the first person to put in the number there uh, should, must put a bid which is greater than or equal to $60, okay? So that $60 becomes the reserve price. Uh, so this, this happens in eBay auction. And in many cases, if the, if the person has reserve price and it's not public, uh, it will be written that the person has a reserve price, and if you don't meet that reserve price, the seller is not under any contractual agreement to sell you that item at a price that you quoted. Okay, so let's say a round trip cost $500. Let's say you have a coupon which says that you can take a round trip flight for free on Delta, on, uh, Delta flight, right? So the person who's selling it might value it at $500. Right? So if you don't, let's say you want to take a trip of $200, then probably you don't want that. You don't want that, uh, that ticket that this person has. Because you don't meet the reserve price criteria. Then you have an auction with entry fee. So now you have two stages for decision making. At the first stage, you decide whether or not you want to pay the entry fee to enter the auction. And at the second stage, you actually bid in the auction and you may or may not win the item. So the entry fee is something that you necessarily have to pay in order to participate in the auction. Okay. Where do we have an auction with entry fee? I think for very high quality artwork, you probably have to pay an entry fee. It's not like anybody can come in and bid a billion dollar for a piece of art by Rembrandt or Van Gogh, right? So they might have an entry fee, but I don't quite know. I've never participated in such auction. You know, my auction, <laughs> my, my experience with auction is limited to eBay auctions. <laughs> and then you have all pay auction. Okay, and this is an interesting, uh, interesting auction. It's also called pay your bid. And it's useful to study competition. 
So what happens in all pay auction, everybody pays the price, whatever their bid price is, but only one person wins. So think about elections. Everyone campaigns, everyone puts in a lot of money in uh, wooing, the ca wooing the public, but then only one person wins the election, other person loses, and so they don't get anything in return. Okay, so that's an all-pay auction. Uh, you have uh, uh, several troops, and you deploy it on several battlefields. Okay, and, uh, and so once you deploy a troop at a specific battlefield, that troop is unavailable to fight on some other battlefield, right? So, uh, so you have paid your bid on individual battlefields, and then you will win some of the battlefields, you will lose some of the battlefields. Uh, so that is all pay auction, okay? Only one person wins a specific battlefield, right? So uh, it's also useful for resource allocation. So let's say you have multiple servers, uh, you want to check for viruses. So what you say is, well, 50% of the server time will go into checking incoming packets for threats, okay, virus threats. So that's an all-pay auction. Whether or not your computer is attacked, you will have to pay that price, which is 50% of your server time just looking for threats or looking for virus signatures and so on. So that's also an all-pay auction. Uh, so Joe is working on something similar, okay, uh, but with resource constraints. So that's known as kernel bloto game, okay? If you have all pay auction, where you have to play multiple auctions, and you have to pay in each of the auctions, but you have a finite amount of resource, you can't pay for all the auctions. Then uh, that's called kernel bloto game. And it, uh, this game dates back to 1920s, okay? So uh, it, was, it was formulated then, but solved very recently. Uh, so those are the common formats for single object private value auctions. And out of this, we have studied the fourth auction format, which is sealed bid second price auction using the VCG mechanism. So we used VCG mechanism to prove that being truthful is the best strategy here. Okay, it's a weakly dominant strategy. Okay, any question? Yeah. So, how do we differentiate uh, private value and common value options when formulating the So, they have different values in function. So, if it's a common value, the private value right. option, right. I might value something, but someone else might not value it. Might not value it, right. So, but still, even if it's a common value, I'll have a different valuation for the same thing, and someone else might have a different value. Well, not really, because you will have the same, you know that what you are willing to, so let's say you have a coal mine. Okay, you know that it has coal worth five billion dollars. Okay, so it's a common value. Everybody has the same value. But are you willing to pay 4.5 billion dollars for getting that coal mine and doing all the work of setting up and extracting the coal and selling it, selling it into the market? So you might say, you know what, I'm a poor person. I'm fine with 0 0.5 billion dollars. No, I don't. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but somebody might say, you know what? I will not do this work of mining coal unless I get $1 billion in profit, right? So that's a common value option. <laughs> okay, $0.5 billion is a lot of money. <laughs> so Vikri was, you know, you, uh, we've talked about VCG mechanism. So Vikri was one of the first person uh, who studied auctions from a game theoretic viewpoint. Okay, that's why, and, and he won a Nobel Prize for that uh, later on. I don't know when though. Okay, so what's the format for sealed bid private value auction? So, let me write it, sealed, no, we didn't say sealed bid, right? Single object, single, object private value auction. So you have n buyers slash bidders.
Uh, their valuation function is in the set VI, which is a subset of R. This is their valuation of, and this is private valuation of the object. of the object it's a subset of r typically vi is typically vi is taken to be compact set 0 v bar okay but that need not be the case in general but this is what typical model is and then we have f I, which is a CDF of private valuation, of player I, of bidder I, or buyer I, bidder I. Okay, so this is cumulative distribution function. This is not probability distribution. So let me just write it, F I, vi equals to probability, or fix is equal to probability, vi is less than equal to x. And then we have for the auctioneer or for the seller, chooses f that maps the bids 0 comma infinity n to a set of probability distributions over the bidders who is actually going to win the auction. So typically, of course, you will say that, you know, the person who has the highest bid wins the auction. So this is not, I mean, this is really a, a, a corner of the simplex. But you know what happens if there are two bidders with the same valuation, okay? They bid the same value. How do you decide who is going to win the item? So in that case, it uses some sort of mixed strategy to figure out who should win the uh, win the auction. Okay, so this is uh, F, and then of course, decide I that maps the bid of individual to uh, to R for every I. Okay, and this is the price. This is the price that buyer I pays to seller I. So this is price that buyer I pays the seller. So in the second price auction, F of all the bids was the highest, uh, I, I star corresponding to the highest uh, bid, and PI was the second highest price for I star and zero for everyone else. So what would be the buyer's goal? The buyer's goal is to, so once the seller chooses the auction format, which is essentially choosing F and PI, so think of it as a Stackelberg game, okay? The seller announces F and PI up front, and then all the buyers play a game, okay? So that's a Stackelberg game, but you know, nobody thinks of it as a Stackelberg game. Everyone thinks of it as a mechanism design game, which is kind of the same thing here. Uh, because F and PI can be thought of as mechanisms. Uh, what seller wants? Seller wants the highest value for the object that it is selling. So if I have a pair of shoes, I want the person who values this pair of shoes, the maximum to pay me a good amount of money, right, for getting the shoes. So sellers, <coughs> seller's objective to maximize, maximize revenue, okay? That's the seller's objective here. So if the seller is a government and it's auctioning off the spectrum, it wants to maximize the revenue. The buyers, on the other hand, they want to maximize value, their value, VI minus PI that they are going to pay. So buyers want to maximize expected value of VI minus PI.
okay? But this expected value depends on f, depends on pi, depends on fi, what the distribution of the private valuation of other bidders are, okay? And of course, its own valuation, private valuation. So that's what it wants to maximize. Okay. Any question? Yeah. F and PI. So F, the seller chooses, so based on all the bids, seller chooses who wins the auction, okay? And if there is a tie among the bids, then it will pick some probability distribution. And then once it chooses who wins the auction, it has to decide how much price each individual is going to pay. In many cases, the person who doesn't win the auction pays zero price. So PI is equal to zero if the person doesn't win the auction. Is that, is that clear? Okay, and in this case, the strategy of buyer I, so strategy is gamma I, which maps VI to zero comma infinity. Okay, this is the bid, this is the bid, bid space. Okay. So let me write some of the big results. Theorem. So the first part of theorem is open bid descending auction is strategically equivalent to sealed bid first price auction. Is that interesting? This has open bid, so the information structure is everyone knows everyone's bid. In this case, the information structure is nobody knows anyone, anyone else's bid. This is first price auction, and this is a descending auction. Okay, and they are strategically equivalent. Okay, and the second, this is, uh, this is English auction, by the way. No, this is Dutch auction. And then the second theorem is, and th by the way, this equivalence symbol signifies strategic equivalence, okay? So the other one is English auction, well, open bid, ascending auction is strategically equivalent to sealed bid second price. Auction. So this is English auction. And of course the third result which is due to Vickery Uh, is that uh, sealed bid being truthful truthful weekly dominates dominates other behavior other behavior in sealed bid second price auction, okay? And this is something we have, we studied in the previous class when we talked about VCG mechanism, that if you have sealed bid second price auction, being truthful is the best strategy. I mean, not, it's only weakly dominates other strategy, other behavior, okay? So what I mean is gamma I star VI equals to VI, <coughs> okay, at equilibrium. So let's uh, 
let's think about why the first equivalence hold I I'm not going to give you a mathematical proof of it but let's discuss conceptually why a descending auction open bid descending auction is the same as sealed bid first price auction so what's happening in this case in this case the price starts from a very high value and then it is descending and then the person who raises his hand first wins the auction okay so nobody knows so if you look at other people they don't know what the value of other people who are participating in that auction is so in some sense the information structure is preserved in these two auctions okay so if information structure is preserved then it leads to the same set of strategies right and since it leads to same set of strategies uh what else oh who wins the auction okay in the sealed bid first price auction the person who bids the maximum wins the auction and pays the price that that he has bid he or she has bid in this case also the person raises his hand when the price matches its value and then he has to pay that price okay so the price is the same the outcome of the auction is the same in this case as well as in this case so therefore these two auctions are strategically equivalent so every equilibrium in this game is an equilibrium in this game and every equilibrium in this game is an equilibrium in this game okay let's look at this open bid ascending auction yeah question so yeah yeah so say i mean both of once you know what the argument is it becomes obvious why these two should be equivalent but this really uh uh it's it's really nice to know that no matter so the information structure is wildly different in these two auctions but uh it gives rise to the same set of equilibrium i, I mean I, for me it's quite uh i mean it's quite uh, surprising that such a result would hold but that is the case indeed in this class of auctions okay any question <clears throat> yeah you spend one the second one is uh, oh okay uh, so open bid ascending auction okay so in this case the price is rising every second okay and the person who raises so let's say i i let's say at 10 there are two at 10 dollars there are two hands up in the air and then when i raise the price to 10 dollars 50 cents only one price is up which means that the person whose price whose hand is up probably values this watch at 11 dollars or 12 dollars that's why he's willing to pay 10 dollars 50 cents for this watch so you are essentially paying almost the same price as the second highest bidder remember the second highest bidder his hand was up at 10 dollars but then it put down put put his hand down at $10.50 so his value probably ranged between $10 to $10.50 okay so the price that the highest bidder is paying is almost equal to the second highest bidder's well you know when you prove this mathematically uh, you are really talking about very infinite so every time so i am saying i raise from $10 to $10.50 but in reality you know like the way you prove it you say well it increases with epsilon to epsilon i don't have that much time to go through <laughs> all possible real numbers between 10 dollars to 10 dollars 50 cents in this class okay it's an uncountable set okay uh okay any other question no what is the trading option of I mean, even there you go again with the same epsilon. Right, right, right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So let's. Uh, so analyzing the general case is fairly difficult. So what we will talk about is symmetric auctions. So what do I mean by symmetric? This V one equals V two equals V three equals V four equals whatever V n. F one equals F two equals F three equals F n. Okay so that means every person has the same set of valuation 
valuation space is the same for every person and the CDF or the probability distribution of the valuation is also the same for every person participating in the game. Okay, so let's talk about symmetric auction. Okay, and our idea, uh, what we want to do, the goal is to characterize uh, the Nash equilibrium of this game. Uh, we will choose F and PI, I mean P1 to PN, according to sealed bit first price auction and sealed bit second price auction. So, how should we go about it? Well, let me first restrict. So, what do we have? V1 equals VN. F1 equals Fn and F1, Fn are independent. Well, I actually shouldn't write F1 to Fn. These are CDFs. So V1 to Vn, V capital N are independent. Okay, they are independent and identically distributed random variables. We are, so of course the ideal case would be we analyze for all possible, we analyze for equilibrium in all possible space of functions gamma i that maps v i to zero infinity, but that's a very big space. So we'll restrict ourselves to monotone uh, policies. So gamma, so let's say beta is monotone uh, policy or bidding policy if v is less than v prime then it implies beta v is less than beta v prime okay so if you if your value is zero dollar uh, actually for zero i think beta zero should be equal to zero I hope they make that restriction. Well, they don't make that restriction, but that's there in the result. Okay, so beta zero should be equal to zero. Okay, so if your value is zero, you will bid zero price for it. And as you increase the value, your bidding uh, price also has to increase accordingly. Okay, so this is a restriction of the original space of all possible bidding policies. So you've restricted the space, you're looking at a more, a much smaller space of bidding policy. Okay, and let's say, so case one, your F, P1, Pn is decided according to sealed bid first price auction. Okay, so which means that f of b1 to bn is equal to arg max i in arg max over all i b i and then p i, let's say this, I will call it i star and p i star equals b i star p i equals zero for all i not equals to i star. So that's my, that's my, that's the sealed bit first price auction. So what is the theorem? We have a symmetric auction with independent valuation and I'm going to restrict myself to monotone bidding policies. 
apologize for that okay that was a little bit of entertainment okay so the theorem is if I restrict myself to monotone policy then my optimal policy beta star v is going to be expected value of x given x less than equal to v where x is a random variable which is maximum of v2 to vn okay and of course since it's a symmetric it doesn't matter all you have to do is remove one of the vi's from this maximum okay so that's my random variable x so x is defined as maximum of n not n but n minus 1 independent and identically distributed random variables uh, we also need to make another assumption that the CDF admits a PDF probability density function and that the probability density function is positive over the entire VI. So I need to make an assumption f of x, not x, x is already, x is defined here. I want to use something else. What should I use? U. No, no. U is utility function. Y. Okay, Y. F of Y equals integral 0 to 0 to Y. F of Y. No, F of T prime. No, F of T dt. So F is the density function of this uh, PDF. And of course, uh, f of t is strictly positive for all t in 0, comma v bar. Okay, this v bar is this uh, number right here. That's the maximum value, possible value that any individual can have in for this particular object that's being sold. How would we go about proving this? Uh, so first of all, so the step one would be to prove that this beta star is a monotone bidding policy. So that's easy to prove. Uh, so the step one is prove beta star is monotone. Okay, so due to this assumption that we made here, it's easy to prove that beta star is actually a monotone bidding policy. And then step two is, what would the step two be? Well, step two is to prove that beta star is best response to beta minus i star. So all other players play beta star, then it's in your best interest to play beta star, play according to beta star policy. Okay. So, Let's uh, try to unravel this particular expression. Just I just I, I don't want to compute the full best response thing, but I want to give you an idea of how to go about proving it, since we already know what beta star looks like. So, what's the expected utility? 
So let's say, uh, so let's say I'm considering player one. So I want to prove that beta star is best response for player one, given that player two, all the way to player n, is playing beta star. So, so what's the expected utility? Or expected value? No, value is something we have already used. So let's say expected utility, it's the probability that x is less than equal to b1. So b1 is beta b1. OK, so let's be, let beta be any monotone policy of player 1. So I have probability of x less than b1 multiplied by, or x strictly less than b1, multiplied by v 1 minus p1. That's the expected value. So what is this probability? This probability is probability of winning the auction winning the auction and this is the uh, the value of the object minus the cost you pay. So value minus cost of object. Okay, so that's the expected utility, fairly straightforward expression. But in order to compute the probability of x less than b1, we have to compute the probability of max of independent random variables being less than b1, right? So how would we do that? So what's the probability of x less than b1? Less than b1. Any thoughts? This is the same as probability of max of v2 vn less than, less than b1. Sorry? Right. It's order statistics. You are way ahead of rest of the class. <laughs> yeah, that is true. It's order statistics. So that's the same as probability of v2 less than equal to b1, vn less than, no, there's no equal to b1. Okay, so v2 less than b1, vn less than b1, v3 less than b1, and so on, which is the same as f of b1 raised to capital N minus 1. Okay, because v2, vn, all of them are independent and have CDF, f of b1, so this is just f of b1 raised to n minus 1. Okay, and what you can do is substitute, well, let's see. Okay, so what I'm going to do is substitute z1 equals beta, star, beta inverse, right? Beta is any such policy, beta inverse b1. Okay, so let's say even though my true valuation is v, v1, I'm going to act as if my valuation is z1, okay? So I'm going to misrepresent myself. And I will, what I'll do is I'll compute the expected utility. So let's say u1 as a function of z1. That will be given by some complicated, ugly expression. 
But what happens when you differentiate it, it will turn out that du1 over dz1 is given by f of x z1 multiplied by z1 minus v1 minus z1. Okay? So what are you doing? Your true valuation is v1, okay, but you want to misrepresent yourself and act as if your true valuation was z1. Okay, and then you compute this expected utility after you massage the equation, make sure you substitute b1 with beta of z1 here, beta of z1 here, and work through these equations, you get some ugly looking expression in z1, okay, in terms of the CDF. You get that, you, you know that I want to maximize, I want to come up with a value of z1 which maximizes my own utility given that others are going to play according to beta minus i star or beta minus one star. If you do that, you get this expression and this should be equal to zero at, at optimal z, z1. But you know that this part is going to be strictly positive, right? This is going to be strictly positive, so it means that v1 has to be equal to z1. Okay, so what it means is there's no reason for you to misrepresent yourself. And in fact, your uh, B1 will turn out to be beta star of V1, which is going to be the same as expected value of X given X is less than equal to V1. Okay, and this is true for player one, but because it's a symmetric game, it's true for every other player as well. So this is the optimal bid, B1 star. Okay, this is the optimal bid, B1 star here. So this is how you would prove a result of this type. Okay, you, you have to make simplifications. Okay, so the simplification we made here are multifold. We assume that the valuation spaces are all the same. We assume that the CDFs are all the same. We assume that the valuations are independent. So it's very much likely that I look at a piece of art and I value it as zero and you value it at V bar. Okay, uh, so valuations are completely independent. Of course, in reality, you know, a good piece of art, the valuations are not going to be independent, okay? Because everyone is going to like that, like that piece of art. But, you know, as, in order to come up with results of this type, you have to make these assumptions. Uh, you can't get around that. Well, maybe somebody else has worked on dependent valuations, but these are the results that are mostly presented in books. Uh, so that's for the first price. So this is sealed bid. First price, and then you have sealed bid second price. In that case, your B1 star is equal to V1. Okay, because being truthful, being truthful is uh, in your best interest. So in this case, you are not being truthful, right? You're not being truthful because you bid your B1 star is not equal to V1, okay? It's a monotonic function of V1. And by the way, if you think about it, see, this is expected value of a random variable given that the random variable is less than equal to V1, right? So this is always going to be less than V1. So your bid is, your B1 star is always less than V1, okay? So your bid is less than V1. In the second price option, your bid is exactly equal to V1. Any question about that? Yeah. Seller? That's the next topic. Okay. 
So that's the next topic. So we, uh, we understood. So remember, what we started with was, well, seller wants to maximize its revenue. Okay, and the buyer are playing a game. They want to have maximum utility, expected utility. Okay, so we now figured out what the lower level game, what the equilibrium of the lower level game is going to be by making some assumptions and restricting ourselves to monotone strategies. Now, we need to understand, if, if I am the seller, if I am the seller and I want to maximize the expected revenue out of this auction that I am conducting, should I pick this one? Because I know people are not going to be truthful, so should I pick this one? Or should I pick this one? Because I know people are going to be truthful, but I'm going to get the second highest price among the bid. So what's good from the seller's perspective? So what are your thoughts? Yeah. Does it depend on capital F? Uh, I mean, the expected revenue, yes. No, you are asking me a question. I'm asking you what is your intuition? What does your intuition suggest? My answer would be, it depends on F. Okay. His answer is it might depend on F. Any other guesses? So as a seller, which one is better? No thoughts? Yeah. I guess the second price. Second. second price. Because people are more truthful, so you expect to gain higher revenue, expected revenue in this auction. Okay, it turns out that the, no matter what the, what format you choose, the expected revenue is the same. Okay, no matter what your F is, no matter what your V bar is, no matter what your uh, any other parameter is. Okay, this is known as revenue equivalence theorem. That kind of kills the joy of studying auctions. No, this is not the one. Okay, so the setting is sealed bed. Symmetric auction. in which your F of B1 to Bn, which are the bits, is arg max of I of Bi. So that's a restriction. And the second restriction Oh, with the highest private value. So this is VI. And if, uh, and PI is such that if VI equals to zero, then pi in expected sense is also equal to zero. Of course, in the second price auction as well as first price auction, if vi is zero, then pi is also zero. Okay. You see, I'm not really talking about sealed bid first price or sealed bid second price. This is any auction. Any auction that you conduct, if it is sealed bid, if it is symmetric, the person who wins the auction has the maximum value, personal value, okay? So that information is sort of hidden from the auctioneer. But if, he has, if the object goes to the person with maximum private value, and the person who doesn't value the object doesn't have to pay anything in expected sense, then in this auction, the revenues are the same. The expected revenue
0 to v bar f x v expected value of x given x less than equal to v f v d v. Okay, so f x is the C D F of x. Okay, so f of x v is equal to f of v raised to n minus 1. And this f of v f of v is d f over d v evaluated at v. Okay, that's just the probability density function of the individual uh, CDFs of individual uh, valuations. <coughs> okay, so let's look at sealed bid first price auction. We know that B1 star or B star, the optimal bid is a monotonic person of monotonic function of the valuation, right? So this is always true because arg max of vi is the same as, well, it's the same as arg max of beta star vi, right? Because beta star is a monotonic function. It's an increasing function. So this is always true. So the hypothesis one is satisfied by the seal bit first price auction. It's also satisfied by seal bit second price auction because B1 star is equal to V1. So this is satisfied for both the auctions. And then PI is equal to zero if the person doesn't win the auction. And if VI is equal to zero, the person is definitely not going to win the auction with probability one. Okay, so the PI, expected value of PI is going to be equal to zero. So both these auctions satisfy these two hypotheses and therefore, the expected revenue doesn't depend on doesn't depend on the format of the auction that you have chosen. Okay, so that's isn't that cool? So it doesn't matter which auction you choose. You know, you are going to get the same revenue. Of course, this is expected revenue. Okay, so only if you run the auction infinite number of times, you will achieve this expected revenue. Right. Individual auction, something might work better than the other, but in expected sense, it's all the same. The expected payment that each individual expects to make you can also show that expected payment EI vi is equal to fx vi multiplied by expected value of x given x less than equal to vi. Okay, this is the expected payment. This is equal to E of vi. So before you enter the auction, you would want to know that this is your value. What would be your expected payment at the end of the auction? So this one gives you that answer. Okay, this is your expected payment as a function of your valuation. Okay, any question? If you look at it, this is just the expected value of the expected payment of n individuals, right, over the entire spectrum of v value uh, 0 to v bar, right. So you take the expected value of EI v and you multiply it by n. Of course, EI V doesn't depend on I at all, okay? There's nothing related to I. So let me just remove I from here. And this is equal to the expected revenue. So that's essentially the proof. How do you get this result? Well, you 
do a lot of complicated integrals and you get the result. Okay, so this is you you get this result from messy integrals. Well, it's not that messy, but it's integration, so elementary calculus, and then you just compute the expected revenue in this in this fashion. Any question so far? Okay, so that's all I have for auction theory. Uh, the next class I'll talk about matching mark matching uh, games. Uh, the idea there is you want to so so here is how it started. Okay, uh, there are people, there are doctors, they want to go to work in specific hospitals. There are students who want to go and study in specific universities. Okay, they have a specific preference order. I prefer Ohio State University over any other university on the planet. Okay, so that was your preference, and so you came here. Okay, so each student has a preference ranking over which university they want to go. Each doctor has a preference ranking over which hospitals they want to work on. Each boy has a specific ranking which girl he wants to marry, each girl has a specific ranking which boy she wants to marry. So this preference is both sided, okay? So each hospital also has a ranking for which kind of doctors they want to hire, whether they want to hire nephrologists, whether they want to hire heart surgeons and so on. Each university has a preference. They want to hire someone with a higher GRE score as compared to a person with a lower GRE score, okay? So there are these preferences on both the sides. So how do you how do you match the set of doctors with the set of hospitals, the set of students with the set of universities? How do you match them so that no student has an incentive to switch the university after going there, or no doctor has an option or has an incentive to switch the uh, residency program that he is going to? And no university has the incentive to fire a student, or no university, or no residency program has an incentive to fire a doctor. Okay, so you want to make it stable. Okay, it's called stable matching. So that's what we want to study in the next class. Uh, and we'll study some algorithms and some open problems. Okay, so matching markets has become important. Now, you know, the person who devised matching market. Uh, got a Nobel Prize in, at some point of time. Why, was, why did he receive Nobel Prize for this uh, market? Well, it turns out that you can use this idea for matching organs, okay? So if you are a person with a specific blood type, specific physiology, you can use that indicators of your health and of your physiology to match to a specific donor, so, okay? So if you go and get your driving license, let's say in Ohio, uh, well, you have to choose whether in case of an accident, if you die, whether your organs can be donated to someone else or not. Okay, so let's say, well, touch wood doesn't happen. Let's say somebody dies in an accident. Okay, so, uh, so then what happens is they use that, that information about blood group and all that. They send that information to some uh, central location and then it does matching with respect to all other people who are looking for, let's say, kidneys or lungs or whatever, liver and stuff, and then it matches the donor to the recipient, and then they basically, there is an emergency operation done and the organ gets transplanted. Now this thing was developed in the US, but at this point of time, it's not there in many other countries, okay? So, if, uh, so this is something that you can probably develop in whichever country you go to, you can probably develop it if it's not already available. So matching market became very famous because of that. Uh, or, or ra rather stable matching algorithm became famous because of this particular application. Now, uh, nowadays, you have problems of uh, matching a rider to a driver, okay? So in Uber, at every point of time, a driver is matched to a rider, okay? So what kind of algorithm should you use in this case of, uh, in this class of problems? So I don't know what ag exactly Uber does, but uh, Actually, Uber gives the option to the driver, okay? So there is this passenger, do you want to pick him up or not? So, so in, in case of Uber, Uber is not doing automatic matching, but once 
autonomous cars come on the road, then aut automatic matching should happen. And so maybe that's something you should, you should study and think about it deeply. Okay, and we'll also talk about some research challenges in matching market. Okay, so talk about it in next class.